we're back with the flow point professor this is uh flow flow point podcast number 17 and i'm here with mateo mateo uh real quick you just tell me what happened in your life in the last 72 hours uh so i ran the san gervasio pro am together with my colleagues at uh, jolly ski and then today i flew to spain for a conference for the world sports psychology conference yeah so <laughs> what, what what a trip what a trip of the last 72 what is it 96 hours yeah yeah we should probably be doing this tomorrow after the conference so you could share some of these uh these things that you're apparently going to learn but that's well right. let me tell you let me tell you i'm sleeping tomorrow morning i'm sleeping in i haven't had a solid night of sleep since I don't know, last week. So <laughs> tomorrow morning, whatever conference or symposium they have, they're not going to see my face. That's for sure. All right. All right. Well, uh, that's all right. We're going to make it work. Apparently, my internet's running a little slow. So I'm going to work my way up here to the deck. There you go. Can you still hear me? Oh, beautifully. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, here we are. So, dude, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it. San Gervasio? San... Yeah, no. Very solid. Okay, very solid. So tell tell me a little bit about that real quick, what that was for people who don't know, and uh, how many years it's been happening. Okay, so that that's a pro tour stop that we have had in in, our, in my home site since 2014. Yep. We started slow, you know, uh, as you know, the IWWF, WWF wants you to have $21,000 to have a elite event. Yep. Uh, but they have an introductory program to where you can start with eight the first year, 14 and a half the second, and then by the third year, you have to be 21, you have to have $21,000 uh, across gender, so men and female per event. Our event is just long event, uh, to be to be able to award elite points. Yep. Right? Yep. And uh, I think we are one of the few instances of the success of this program. So we started $8,000 in 2014. Uh, and we had a fair showing, you know, we weren't expecting a lot of pros to come with not a lot of money. But then you, you make it work, you make sure you're somewhat breaking even, and then mm -hmm. your club members encourage you to do it the next year. And last year we reached the 21,000 benchmark and we were able to do it again this year. That's awesome. That's awesome. So tell me, um, just real quick, where is the event? And uh, I mean, how much work is this for you to put on an event like this or to, to, to help put the event on? It's a, it's a lot of work, Marcus. Uh, um, we organize a lot of events in San Gervasio. On average, we have about three to four RC events per year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we organized a under 21 Europeans in 2007 and then we organized the Junior Worlds in 2010 and uh, particularly the Junior Worlds was a lot of money just to pay just to be able to say that, that the event is the Junior Worlds and me and my dad and my coach and my coach son like we started thinking that I don't we don't see the point you know yep. um, the club wasn't getting the ski school wasn't getting new skiers there just wasn't a lot of uh, return on that investment sure uh, uh, and so we said well why not spending the same amount of money but hopefully in a smarter way and giving it to the athletes you know and so we started with a small pro event and that kept growing and uh, the event is in San Gervasio which is in the middle of the Brescia province so center north before the booth starts um, and so, that's yeah can, can I, can I, like, if I was in downtown Venice with my pro star, like ripping around the, the, the waterways, could I drive to your lake from Venice or is that a little too far? That's a little too far. I mean, you, you can't boat there, yeah. but if you, if you wanted to drive from Venice, it's about a two hour drive. Can we go, what? can we go ski through downtown Venice? I have. You have? I have done it once. Yeah. Uh, our national team back in the day had like a promotion program, so they would take some of us from the tournament skiing team, some of us from the barefoot team, some of us from the wakeboard team, and we would do shows around the, the country to promote the sport. And one year in March, with snow on the freaking roads, we skied downtown Venice. That's that awesome. was that was a highlight, man. I'll tell you that. 
That's crazy. That's that's like once in a lifetime, dude. Yeah, it really was. It was you know we one of my friends dog started on one of the dogs in Venice by sliding on the snow on the dog <laughs> and then hopped and went in. Matteo D'Alberto, you probably remember him. Yeah, yeah, and and those docks, those docks aren't like appropriate height. They're like five or six feet tall, aren't they? Yeah, that was more about yeah. I would say four, four to five. So you yeah. just slide it on the snow with his trick ski, a little ollie hop, we'll pop. and just yeah, just land and slam on the water. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's cold water. You're in a dry suit, probably. Yeah, what, no, that's what we're wearing. Yeah. Where where are you? It looks like you're in a kit. Are you a chef like by night? Are you a, no? Do you cook? I'm, I'm calling you in from the kitchen here in this apartment we have in Sevilla for the conference. I'm literally next to the router, so nice. that's the best internet that we can get. It's nice. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. good. I can't tell if it's lagging video because of me or because of you, but it doesn't really matter because people are still going to hear it anyway. There you go. There you go. Exactly. I know I have a good connection here. I tested it before. <clears throat> So, so I got a couple questions, a couple quick questions, then we're going to get to some listener questions, comments, and then we're going to wrap it up. So, yeah. um, first question, uh, you just hosted the, the pro-am at your mm -hmm. event, third year in a row at your lake. I mean, and I want to hear one or two things that stuck out to you, whether it was, you know, something about the athletes, something about running an event that you just, you know, came to a realization of or something maybe what separates the great skiers from the good skiers, a anything, any insight that you may have come across over the last couple of days that you want to share? Yeah, I, I mean, I obviously skied the event, but uh, when, I, when I organize this event, I'm an organizer. So I want to make sure to create the best event possible. And then since it's in my home site, I put my ski on and I, and I try to ski it. But I mean, concrete legs and, you know, I, I skied a good first round, but it wasn't the best tournament. Like, I, I can give you this advice. If you want to ski a good event, don't organize it. Just go <laughs> ski somewhere else, you know. But uh, so I, I think I can think about it more from an organizer perspective. And we have been doing a professional and amateur event or a pro-am, right? Mm -hmm. And that brings in... It's such a cool dynamic, you know, like I've skied pro events where it's just us and we battle it through and, and it's cool for other reasons. But what we did, what we did like the, this year again were, was the first day, the Friday is just amateurs, two round amateurs, RC, ski your best. And then the Friday evening is the, we have a dinner at a farm about a kilometer away from the site where we mingle in amateurs and pros. They're having food, you know, having fun. And then I step out with a microphone. I remember the pros, the format for the days following. And then we present them with the bib, which is something that I actually stole from snow skiing. You know, in, yeah. in the World Cup, they, the top 16 get presented in the valley at the main square with the bib that they will be wearing, be wearing for the finals. Yep. Uh, uh, so we did something similar, like we present the bib to each and every athlete that skis the pro event on the Saturday, and then we give the, so we have red bibs for the pros and then the blue bib for the defending champion. And just seeing the dynamic of like, we, we actually had a long, it was like about 100 people dinner, and then it was literally, the setup at the table was amateur pro, amateur pro, amateur pro. That's cool. And they loved it. They loved it, both the amateurs, obviously, and the pros, you know, like I was at dinner with Thibaut and Danielle Bennett and, and Manon yesterday, and they were all saying how it was so cool for them as well, you know. Um, I think the, the whole Pro-Am format can really serve the sport very well, and it's been working for us. What I was going to say, what's why do you think it is that pros are like, stoked like Manon and Danielle and others they're stoked that they get to hang out with normal skiers right because in other sports you see it in movies that make fun of pro athletes like you know some kid asks for an autograph and the pro athlete's too cool and their head's too big and they have too many other things to do and they they write the kid off or whatever you know that happens but in our sport it doesn't really happen and yeah. what what I mean what do you think is the reason is because we're so small or is it because our athletes actually care more or, you know, what, what is it? I think, I think 
being in touch with the amateurs in water skiing reminds you of how small we are, you know, and that's good to remember. You know, if you're a water skier that is trying to make a living out of this, it's good to be in touch with the with the um, I guess the size and, and the numbers of your sport because if you are a committed athlete in any sport I don't care how big it is you're obviously in your own bubble you're trying to become better at what you do and that's how it should be yeah. but sometimes getting reminders of like hey we are skiing at the same lake I saw you running your PB that's pretty cool you know like yeah, yeah. and or, or, hey, I we're doing the same three names I said those two or three names because I was at dinner with them after the event yesterday, but Will, Tigas, Nate, they all said, like, it's such a cool dynamic to be all together, you know, because the format of the event is two rounds amateurs Friday, two qualifying rounds pros Saturday, then the amateurs ski their third round Sunday morning, and then in the Sunday afternoon we have the head-to-head finals. So everyone is always, you know, in contact. Yep. You know, Con- constantly mingling. Yeah. 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 That's cool. So, so if you could, um, just real quick, uh, in regards to the event, what's one thing about skiers, guys or girls, one, one takeaway that you had, like whether it was a, a technical, uh, observation that you made or, um, you know, something I know I'm kind of digging a little deep here. Maybe, maybe there's nothing to, for you to say about this, but just curious, because you just were brushing shoulders with the best guys and girls skiers and slalom in the world at your home site, and uh, wondering if there's any fresh takeaways besides that, like more technical. Yeah, more technical. I guess you're running in the event, the event, so you weren't really watching. No, so, I, I didn't watch that much. Yeah. And you know what? Like my dad, my coach, they don't really. I've, I've had a great fortune of skiing pro events and and you know, getting to know you guys and, and being part of this world. But my, my dad, my coach, they don't really do it. So the Sunday particularly, I force them to just sit on the shore and watch as much as they want. Yeah. And I'm running around, you know. Yeah. But I did see a few sets of the head-to-head. Obviously, I would have liked to ski in it, but I didn't make it. Um, I you think ran, you ran in the 41 off. You ran in the 10 5 yeah, the first round, but I only had one at 41. And the way we work it is that top four of first round are top seed of the head-to-head, and then top four of second round yeah. are bottom seed of the head-to-head. And the second round, I missed 39, so I had no chance. Yeah. Um, the um, technical thing, you know, let, let me think about this for a second, because the, we had some interesting matchups, you know, like Nate did no gates at 35 first round, yeah. so he had to qualify second, like last yeah. year. And so he ended up fifth seed, which meant that he ended up meeting top seed or the winner of first versus eight in the semifinal. Mm-hmm. And so that was Tigas this year. And that was a bananas head to head. Like Tigas ran four, almost got a piece of five at 41. Yeah. Nate just stretched himself to five and, and managed to make it through. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy level, man. Crazy level. Um, and then JT, like, solid all the way through. I mean, I think this tournament, regardless of the matchup, it was a lot about consistency, you know? Like, um, JT did 2 of 41 all the rounds he skied, literally. First round, second round, runoff, because we had a runoff in second round to determine the bottom seeds. Yep. And then uh, quarterfinal, semifinal, final, like, you know, I, he was upset at a couple of twos because he had great ones, right? And then at two, he was struggling a little bit, and he was JT upset. But yet, that brought him all the way through the finals, you know? Yeah. Like, yep. skied against Thibaut in the semis. Thibaut was looking really good this week, and he made a minor mistake. JT kept his solid score and made it through the finals, you know? So, so you know, like, I think because conditions were superb this weekend, and you would on the, expect on the girl side, even like Regina, she at that last round, she ran, didn't she run 39? Pretty much like pretty easy, pretty easily, or the second to last round. Yeah, no, she ran 39 pretty much any time, you know. And M- Manone uh, ran, uh, how many 39s did she run? She ran one in the semifinal and actually tied her own European record of one at 41. Yeah. And it was 
I thought she was close to get a piece of two. I mean, one was heavy, but held on to the slack and threw her ski out, but lost the handle. But that was close. Huh? That was really close. And Regina, second round, had a phenomenal one and then rushed two a little bit and then missed three. But she was like, on that the was way. the one to go on, you know? Yep. Um, and then we let up five at 41 that, I mean, he was, you know, binding his hands, you know, the, the, the hour after, cause it was a solid 41. Yeah. Tika, the first round where he qualified top seed, I was on the shore, like on, on the dog side, but I thought he was going to bring that one home. I mean, you know, providing great conditions is a mixture of a lot of variables some of which, most of which you control, some of which you can't. And luckily the ones that we can't came together, like very little wind, yep. no rain, uh, water level, phenomenal, the lake. Yep. And then the, everything else, boats, buoys, docks, everything was lined up to the best of our ability and it, and it seemed to have worked. It's awesome. Hey, so, so to change gears, uh, what happens when your beard gets too long and you start tripping on it? Well, let me revert the question to you with your dreads. What do you do? I think you may beat me. I think you may get there before me. I'm never going to let the dreads get that long. They're already too long. It already makes certain tasks <laughs> difficult. Yeah. What? Well, the beard does too. I mean, soup <laughs> is a challenge. I'll tell you that. Soup. Yep. Soup is tough. Wings. Tough. You are in the soup kitchen right now. Ribs, yeah. Yeah, tough. ribs, tough, yeah. Okay, a yeah. couple quick questions. Uh, you're coaching a beginner water skier, 30 miles an hour, 15 off. Um, mm -hmm. What are the two most important tips you would give them, just the average beginning, beginning level skier? Um, I would say I'll give you a technical one, which is learn how to stand on your ski perpendicular to your ski, you know, like don't break, don't make sure that your body, if, if your ski would form a cylinder, don't ever get out of that cylinder, you know, and learn how to, you know, the old adage be on your front foot, but mainly learn how to stay with your ski as you go, because I think that's, that's the new way of skiing. And, and that really makes the most, makes you use the most out of the equipment we have. Yep. Um, and from a more of like a mental psychological side, I think just, uh, understanding that there are steps and that you shouldn't be rushing through them. You know, like I see a lot, like even from a more amateur side, I see a lot of people getting out with two skis, maybe doing a couple of sets and then rushing to one ski. And I think it's wrong, you know, like. The second you get on two skis, you can do so many things that will help you a lot when you get on one ski. Sure. Like mini course, uh, learn how to cross the wakes, learn how to feel the rope when you get on the side of the boat and actually do a turn as opposed to wait until you get back up behind the boat and then change, you know, change direction. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's a bit of a bit more patience, you know, like don't look at don't look online too much about what others are doing. Uh, trust one person and, and go with that. So a couple listener questions. I like that answer, by the way. Um, oh. for, first, first one comes from Sean Kirkwood. He's in Queensland, Australia. Um, he says, I also think, uh, let's see, says a long-term striving for inclusion in the Olympics uh, might be useful. And his mm -hmm. question or his, his driving factor is, he says, wasn't that one of the main uh, motivating factors for speed control? And would... Inclusion in Olympics help water scheme. Could it help water scheme? What do you think? Well, I, I have the feeling that like you would be more, uh, uh, it'd be more proper for you to answer this question. I can give you, I guess, an opportunity for learning that I think I have. Um, so, you know, surfing will be in Tokyo 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what, what's going on in the U.S. with that, but in Italy... The, Olymp the president of the Olympic Committee asked the Italian Water Ski Federation to include surfing. So to give them some kind of structure and help them prepare for the, for the Olympics. And I'm, I'm going to try to learn as much as possible from this experience. I mean, obviously, it, they are now in the same federation as us. 
Yeah. And I really want to try to know the technical director because he was a very strong surfer back in the day and understand what it took for surfing to be accepted. Because, you know, we have been in the bids for the last four Olympics. We make it to the first stage and then they just dis disregard us. Yep. And I am I'm of the school of thinking that it's not the boats, it's not the speed control, it's the politics. Yeah. We have very poor quality politics representing us, so yeah. that's that's why we're not at the Olympics. Yeah, I, uh, I I would tend to agree. You know, but but uh, but to answer the question, you feel like it could be a positive mode or a positive thing for the sport of water skiing if it happened. I, uh, you know, honestly, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I think from a maybe from an ama amateur perspective. You know, but uh, but then again, like there's so many sports that have less numbers than us at the Olympics that you watch at the Olympics. They're entertaining, but then you don't go and think, damn, I can't wait to find a ice rink and do some curling tomorrow. You know? <clears throat> yeah, true. So but, I don't know. I but have. I. The question would be: Isn't water skiing more compelling and more widely practiced than curling, and therefore? If there was more exposure to it on national television, at least every four years, you know, international television, wouldn't that create more buzz and more uh, notoriety and potentially more sales? It's a it's a question that I and I'm not so sure how to answer. I, I want to think that I really <clears> want to <throat> think that I and I and obviously I think my our sport is super cool, like, but. I don't know. I don't know how much it would help. Have uh, you ever I'm seen the Have you ever seen the Colbert Report? Of course, yeah. Did you Do you remember when um, when Stephen brought on uh, the what was his name? The uh, he was the executive director of I think speed skating or something. Okay. In the, in the America, his name is Bob Crowley, I believe. Okay. Now now he's our executive director. Or president, oh, yeah. or top guy. Of AWC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but he was he went on Colbert because Colbert single handedly funded the that sport, I believe, for the Olympics back in maybe Torino or something, Italy. I don't know. Anyway, I don't have my facts straight, but point is, things like that can happen if you're in the Olympics, right? You get on prime time television, and. But I guess the question is, did pros did uh. Speed skating athlete get more money consistently. Did more people watching that ended up taking speed skating and trying speed skating? I don't know. Maybe so, but I think there's, I think there are other venues to promote the sport. And honestly, I think that what you started trying to bring it back to the to its roots to make it more available, not to have to have like. 20 grand to be able to ski on a piece of lake. Mm -hmm. I think that's more what I resonate, what resonates with me as far as promoting the sport. Yeah. So, okay. So let's move on. Totally unrelated ski question from a guy named Dave Ross. Uh, he says non water ski question, but a common issue when a kid is in a school sport or team sport and the coach sucks, how does one best deal with that both as the athlete and as a parent of that athlete? Um, well, let's go with the second one. As the parent of the athlete, if the coach sucks from a technical perspective, then maybe you're not the best judge of that and it shouldn't be your call. But if it's really sucks as far as like, you know, verbal abuse and, and not giving fair play time and, and the kid is just hitting the situation, then it's probably wise to remove the kid, you know, if at all possible. Yeah. From an athlete perspective, that's a tough one. I think it depends a lot on the athlete's age, you know. So um, someone who is in early adolescence, so 11, 12 years, years old, uh, will have the cognitive ability to understand that that's not right. Mm -hmm. They won't just go, oh, that's all I've experienced. Uh, but a seven, eight-year-old, unfortunately, will not be able to discern uh, whether that's the proper way of being coached or not. Yeah. And that's where the parent becomes really important. Now, yeah. unfortunately, that can like extend to the opposite side when you see that coaches that are just trying their best and you know they're 
they're trying to help as much as, as they can. The parent doesn't see as much improvement as they as they would like, like. and they just blame the coach. Yeah, yeah. So it's a fine you know, line. It's a very fine line. It's a very fine line. But uh, my my recommendation, and I give that to a lot of water ski parents as well, is pick one person if you trust them. Give the kids to their uh, basically give that to them as far as the sport is concerned. And then sort of check in every now and then, both with the with the with your son or daughter, mm -hmm. or by observing what you see. And yeah. if you decide to change, please don't make it a technical thing. Make sure it's like something that for the benefit of the person. You know? Yeah, for sure. I like that. That's yeah. good. Good advice. <clears throat> All right, I got another one. This might be a bit of a long one um, for you to answer, but you can keep it as short as you want. Uh, Steve Thompson from Sun Valley, Idaho. He says. How does a middle-aged skier that wants to recommit to water skiing approach it, both physically, mentally, otherwise? Wants to get back into skiing. Yeah. Well, I think I think get updated. You know, like I've seen a few skiers at my club that were out for a few years and then they come back, and they they stay with old ideas that a sport like ours that con constantly develops. We keep learning more about it. Uh, the first thing I would do is ask a bunch of questions like what is the gear that works now? What are the things that people are trying on the water? Um, what is the safest way for me to get out there? Uh, you know, especially because if you've been out for a few years, you're also those years older mm -hmm. as, as a person. Mm -hmm. So I think like a lot of information gathering and again, patience because it's going to be tricky. Like, Say you've been out of the sport, like let's say you were running 20 at all, and then you were out of the sport for 10 years, you come back, you're probably going to get to 22 off level in, in a heartbeat, mm -hmm. really. Like it's, you're going to recover fast, and maybe quite fast to the level you were before, but then you expect that progression going, and it's not going to happen, you know? Yeah. So patience is going to be key even there. Prepare mentally for that. For that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Like know that you'll get back to where you were f f quite fast, quite quickly, mm -hmm. but don't expect to keep going that way once you reach the level that you used to be. Yeah. You know? Sure. Um, there are steps. There are steps to be taken. Patient, trust, you know, your scheme partner or um, watch video, but like know that those are hurdles to, to jump on and, and it takes a while, but the process is super fun. That's why you came back to the sport, you know? Yep, exactly. All right, buddy, I got a couple of comments, just uh, random people that have emailed in. Bob mm -hmm. Bulfer says, I love the podcast. Keep up the great work. My two oldest sons, seven and six, are getting into skiing tournaments and found the podcast with Matteo Luziri to be very insightful. So there's, wow. there's Thank the, you. Thank you. And another, uh, another buddy, a uh, friend, John Carter from Tennessee, Really, really enjoying the little glimpse into the lives of people who we may not have otherwise got to know or be exposed to, and a nice mix of philosophy and some technique as well. Just finished Mateo's and felt compelled to let you know it's been really good. So, wow. Flow Point Professor is really making an impact here on the Flow Point podcast. Wow, so, I don't know the whole professor thing as in sync thing, but yeah. I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad what we are chatting about is is that people find that interesting and helpful. You know. Yeah, we may have to make both of ourselves more presentable. Maybe get a bow tie, maybe a suit jacket or something. I don't know. I, I thought you meant like a little shave and a haircut, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not, that's gonna happen. No, dude, we're not. We're not going there. That's off limits. It's off limits. Okay. Anything else okay. you want to talk about? Have I asked you this one before? What would you tell your 18-year-old self if you could go back in time? Did you I have. You have. I can't you remember what you said. Yes. Answer, an, update the answer. Update the answer. What would you tell yourself? Yeah, to live more in, to live more in the present, that was a, the, the answer I gave you. Like when I was 18, I was just too much like get down with high school, leave Italy, move to the U.S., be a collegiate skier and become a pro skier and boom. Um, and then it's funny, like this morning, I, uh, before I flew here to Spain, I brought Danielle, and she's a great friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I brought her around the area where I'm from, the natural lake where I live. And, uh, and we were biking around this little island and I thought, like I stopped again, like I've been stopping to observe where I'm from in the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could have appreciated more when I was 17, 18, rather than just like being so constantly 
plan oriented and future oriented just sit down and, and enjoy where you're from because you never you never think where you're from is cool because uh, you know it you know you everything else where is more interesting but then you come back after a man 10 years i've been living this for 10 years yeah. you know so you come back after a while you're like whoa that's that's pretty good so live more in the present like in, enjoy the the moments that you happen to be living you know that's good and you have been in the, in the u.s quite some time 10 years that's I can't believe you don't, I mean, you've been in the South. I can't believe you don't talk with like some sort of weird accent, like, you know, like they talk down there in the South, but. That's for you. That's for you to, to tell me. I don't, I don't think I have an accent. You also. kept it pretty good. So two things. Number one. Yes. I just heard last week I went to a lake out here in Colorado and I heard a young lady say, uh, in regards to going to college, she's like, I'm going to go anywhere, but Colorado, I want to get out of this place. And I'm sitting here looking around like, Colorado actually is pretty – actually, where, where you live is pretty cool, but it's yeah. exactly what you just said. Like, when you're young, you want to get to the next step. If you're 15, you want to drive now so you can have your freedom. If you're yeah. 18 or 17, you know, it, it just – the list goes on. You always want to be a little older. You always want to be in the future. So one last question along those lines because I think today more than ever, not just in skiing – so this could apply to – every sport or every endeavor, but in, yeah. in, in sports in general, kids are becoming really good. And like, I mean, some of the best female trick skiers in the world, the best female trick skiers in the world aren't even in college yet. So most of them, one of them is, but most of them aren't. What yeah. do you tell kids like that and others who are at like the elite level, like some, to some of the best skiers in the world or the best athletes in the world, but yet you don't want them to miss out on their life, right? Because when you're 15, 16, 17, 18, you compromise a lot to be the best at something in the world. So yeah. what would you, what would you tell them based on your answer to your 18 year old self? I guess it's the uh, same. Well, maybe not based on my 18 year old self, but based on what you just finished saying and the sacrifices, I think one of the things that you sacrifice training that hard that soon and i mean me and you did it as well mm -hmm. is social life which is not in the fluffy sense do something that is not sports and be with kids but it's like learning how to behave with another human being or a group or within a group of human beings and the best way to do it is when the human beings are similar to you particularly in age yep. and i'm so scared of these young elite athletes that kind of snob tournaments of their own age category because they're good enough to ski elite. Mm -hmm. And I'm scared about it because of that precise reason. The ability, they, they miss out on the ability of being able to socialize and be proper behaved with people of their age, which is how you learn, you know? Sure. It's, I, I would argue though that there are so many good young skiers that there's a chunk of them going up to say ski in the real masters instead of the junior masters. And so they're, and they're all in the dock or the pavilion anyway together. So they still, they still hang out with their crew, but I understand what you're saying. Like that is an important part of developing your social aptitude is. Yeah, but that's, and I agree, but that's three skiers four. I'm speaking of nationals yep. under 21 worlds, junior Europeans, where there's like a hundred kids. Sure. And you know your age and you want to be able to just interact with them, you know, mm -hmm. like and the game of interaction is not a game of who wins. It's a game of who wants you, who wants to invite you to play with them again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such a complete paradigm shift from sports or competitive sports that but it's yet so important as a human being, you know, um, sure. Yeah, I think the advice that I will give, which was given to me and I've heard being given to other, other athletes is you may be good enough to ski under 21, but if you're 15, go ski under 21, but make sure you go ski under 14 and under 17 with kids of your age so yeah. you can socialize and, and, be, and become a, develop as a good person as well. So, so to, one last thing. I wanted to cut it off. I didn't want it to go so long, but I did have a thought. You just spurred an idea. And this is something I've learned over the years, and you already know this, but
But and we've talked about it, that idea that as a skier or as an athlete, as a young and up and coming athlete, um, we tie our self worth and and our value and how other people look at us to how we perform, whether yeah. it's in the arena, on the water, whatever. And and it's not immediate feedback, but it's like when you ski bad, you realize people don't come up and say, "Hey, good skiing." When you ski good, everybody's like, "Hey, man, that was awesome! Great set! You know, great, great event, whatever." So we learn that, like, it's positive or negative reinforcement. I don't know what the word is, but in the social setting, it's the same thing. We all want to be accepted. We all want to. We all have certain people we want to be friends with, and we want to be, you know, as we grow up. And the problem is you get that immediate feedback that if somebody shuns you or they don't want you to go hang out with them or have lunch with them or whatever, I think as a developing youth, that can hurt and that can reflect then on your self-image and you say, oh, I'm not good enough or I'm not cool enough or I'm not whatever. But in, at the end of the day, we always, we always come out on top and we always learn one way or another that you want to be friends with people who don't judge you by how you ski or by how you perform, but they judge you for who you are and how you treat people. And so it's the same thing in the social circles. I don't know how I got on this tangent, but it's the same thing. Like if somebody doesn't want to be your friend or hang out with you or, you know, invite you to lunch or whatever, screw them. It doesn't matter. Like obviously they don't see your value. So you can't judge your self worth based on other people's actions. And that, I think that's, you know, Something yeah. that people overlook, especially youth no. growing up, teens, because it's hard. Yeah, no, I, I agree that it, it's a complicated issue, right? And and again, I think most of the times, uh, again, to be well developed, socialized human being is is not about winning the games that you're invited to play, but play them fair to where they'll invite you to play again. And this is particularly true, we know this from, from all sorts of different scientific approaches in the developing youth, like from three to eight years old, when you're forming yourself as a, as, as a primate with a better brain, essentially. Mm -hmm. So like, it's important to learn that, and if you don't learn it at that age, you better learn it as soon as possible. Otherwise, your self-worth becomes clinched on things that are not that important, Marcus. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like if I ran three or one and a half, I mean, I shouldn't be thinking of myself as a, le a less of a person. But we know it happens. Yeah. And I think being placing your kid in a position where he or she has to be good at being invited again Okay, and obviously this is fairly abstract. I mean, like yeah. you're on the, you know, you're playing on the on the floaties before you ski. Hopefully, your kid is one of those kids that other kids want to play with. And if he or she isn't, then you better put him or her in those situations as much as possible so that they learn. Yeah, you know, I agree. So we're almost forty minutes in. I got one more question because I just thought of this and it's totally random, but. Sure. I remember years ago, 10 years ago, at the World Championships in Aus Austria, yeah. a guy named Mike Ferraro came up to me and had me do this visualization exercise where I visualized running a slalom pass. And we yeah. all know at 36, how, how many seconds does it take to get through the slalom course? 1608. Yeah. So what was interesting was I wasn't the only one. He was doing this with everybody. When you visualize... Do we visualize slower or faster or real time? Usually. Um, it, depend, it depends. Like the tendency is to, to do slow, uh, particularly if the skill hasn't been ingrained very well. I think a tricking example would be simpler. So if you've been able to land a flip for the last 10 years, you're going to imagine a flip in real time. Yeah. But if you just learned to flip last month, probably you're still going to imagine it in a slower speed. Right, but and what? We'll see, I, I make no. It makes perfect sense. But my question is, I was visualizing thirty-two off, and it took me like twenty-five seconds. So I was right. essentially going like twenty-four miles an hour. What's what's the deal? Well, I mean, obviously, at the if you were at the World Championships, you had been running like thousands of thirty-two offs. That's not an issue. There, the thing is that you probably haven't 
vi- Ed visualized the whole log before Mike asked you to do it. Hmm. So visualization or, ment- or imagery also needs to be practiced as well. So the more you imagine, the better you become at imagining. And we know that the better way of imagining is imagining in real time. Yeah. Unless, again, it's some kind of skill that you're trying to learn, yeah. then if you have to Great go time. slow speed, it's fine. But what we know is that there's a correlation between how close the time of your, imagi- of your imagining is to the actual action, so 16 or 18 slalom, and how good you are improving in that action. So, so should we yeah. be visualizing? Should, we, should people be monitoring how long it takes them to visualize a pass or a, you know, any other sport activity? Should they be trying to match real time and be, be actively weekly or monthly testing to make sure that they are moving closer or trending closer towards real time visualization? I think so. I think so. And if it doesn't happen, so if it's like slower or, or faster maybe, but generally it happens that it's slower. Uh, I think don't jump to the conclusion that you don't know how to do whatever motor skill you're imagining. It may be that you just are not that trained in visualization yet. Sure. And that's what I figure like me or, or some sports psychologist can help you improve on that. Yeah, cool. Awesome, dude. Well, thanks for taking the time. This has been real fun. And uh, I know it's late. It's like, oh, wow, it's really late. It's 2.20 a.m. 2.20 a.m. Wow. Yes, sir. Folks, the professor is dedicated to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much, buddy. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure, man. Thank you so much for keep doing this. And also, thank you so much for what you did this third year in a row for this event. I fourth know, year. Four, sorry, fourth year. I said third last earlier, too. My bad. <laughs> fourth year. Um, I know how hard it is to put on events and ski. You still ran into 10 to 5 meters. That's rad. And I know all the skiers probably appreciate it more than they can show you because as a skier, we're all in our own world. So it's really hard to reach out, but just know they that have shown it. they have shown awesome. it. I'll, I'll tell you, it was, it was particularly humbling because obviously it's, I'm a skier and I'm organizing this and no, everyone from Nate to Regina, everyone were like, yeah, we're coming back next year. Please make it happen again. Right. And I said, of course, now I was tired and confused. And of course, it's going to happen again next year. Like yeah. we know we can make it happen again. But no, a, a, a bunch of appreciation from judges, staff, crowd that showed up, amateurs, pros, which is what keeps you going. You know, like yep. if you can financially do it and people are enjoying it, you know. And I don't know, I don't know if you had a chance to watch the webcast, but Vince and Tony did a fantastic job. Man. Really well done. It's really Fantastic. well done. They are, you know, and they're the best. Like, you couldn't find two more different personalities coming together to do it. But the passion they have is beyond belief, man. They yeah. showed up two days before the event on site, 7 in the morning, left at 8 p.m., like working constantly to try to give a good product, you know, for, for those who wanted to tune in and watch. And, I mean, kudos to them. What a, what a superb job. Yeah, it was really it was it was really easy to watch. It was smooth. It was up to date. Really well done. And your event was really well done too. So thank you again, buddy. And thanks for joining me at such a late hour. No, of course, of course. No worries. I, I, I haven't promise. been sleeping that much in the last two weeks. So. I, I figured you just it's just standard for you right now. So uh, yeah. just so people know, I think in the future we have we got to your on your outline, we were supposed to talk sometime about nuts and bolts of motivation, the why of being on the water, all that kind of stuff. Have we talked about that yet? We haven't. Uh, let so, me get back to the United States in a couple of weeks, and then we'll get on it. We will Next time we get the professor on, we'll be talking about why you ski. And if you're having pro- problems with motivation, we'll, we'll help you out. Thanks, yeah. buddy. Chill, chill conversation. <laughs> yeah, super, super chill. All okay. right, man. Thanks again. It was really fun. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Of course.